There are movies out there which are filled to the brim with sadness, suffering, despair and hatred which deliberately use sensitive themes in order to make it their sole goal in life to make you feel as terrible as possible. Eden Lake is one of those movies. It's a film which will leave you feeling much worse than when you initially turned it on. A movie which has you glued to the edge of your seat for over half of its running time, shocking and disturbing you at about every possible chance it gets with its brutal depictions of human savagery. Done in a way that seems to hit harder due to the fact that all of the events seem grounded in reality. It's portrayed as not some sort of story which could only take place in fiction, but as something which very well could have or could even end up happening. The movies which take place in a real and believable world are always the ones which are most effective for me. At the end of the day, fiction is fiction, but real life is real. Cause let's face it, we all know what humans can be capable of doing. The movie begins by introducing us to our two main characters and protagonists. Steve, as he waits outside in the car to pick up his teacher girlfriend Jenny as they're about to leave for a weekend getaway to visit a lake where he plans on proposing. During their journey, we get some not so subtle foreshadowing with a radio segment talking about parents struggling with controlling their children's behaviour and how it seems to be coming more and more of a problem. They arrive at the village near the lake and decide to stay at the local pub for the night, but it's clear right from the get go that they absolutely do not have any respect from these rowdy locals. It's not exactly described as to why the locals don't seem to be fans of them. Do they not like outsiders? Are they just horrible in general? Or is this the director's interpretation of the British working class? The latter being a theory which I don't believe to be true, but it has seen itself be the subject of criticism in the past with other people reviewing the film, in its attempt to demonise the everyday hardworking British people. But if you're going to use that as a reason, then you're going to need to apply that theory to just about every group who have been the subject of a horror movie. The next day, they head deep into the woods until they eventually reach the lake. While they're trekking through the woods, they spot a lone child, sitting on his own researching some bugs. Jenny, being a teacher, approaches him to talk in a friendly manner, but he doesn't seem to be much of the talkative type and would just rather stick to himself. So they decide it's best to leave him be and to carry on with whatever he was doing. While they're relaxing alongside the lake, enjoying the weather, two young teenagers appear and begin harassing the kid that they passed earlier on until he takes off running. Some time has passed and a group of them have now formed just a stone's throw down the beach, where they're listening to music, being obnoxious and not very attentive to their dog who keeps bothering Jenny. Steve walks over to them and asks them in a polite and friendly manner if they could please turn down their music and get a hold of their dog, but is instead greeted with nothing but disrespect from these children. Steve, with his masculinity being threatened by a bunch of kids, decides it's probably not worth kicking up much of a fuss. He turns the music down himself and then walks away. In response, they immediately turn it back up and when the group leave later, they start hurling insults and exposing themselves. It's about this time where you start to realise this more than likely isn't going to be some sort of isolated incident. They're going to be trouble for this couple, confirmed due to the fact that when Steve and Jenny attempt to leave the next day to go and get some breakfast, they don't realise that one of the youths have put a glass bottle underneath the wheel, causing it to shatter and pierce through the tyre when they attempt to drive away. These seemingly random acts of instigation by the group don't seem to be all that terrible at first, from threatening Steve's masculinity in front of his girlfriend to straight up destruction of his property. But from here on out, things are about to disturbingly escalate. Later that day back at the beach, when Steve returns from scuba diving while Jenny sleeps on the beachfront, they realise that their beach bag has been stolen, which happens to contain their car keys. Steve immediately thinks the worst, and upon reaching where his car is supposed to be parked, his fears are realised, the car has been stolen. After walking through the woods in an attempt to find it, out of nowhere, they're both almost run down by their own car as the teenagers have taken it for a joyride, with them then speeding off into the woods after hurling some insults. Day turns into night and Steve and Jenny are still looking for their car. 
Eventually, after a long trek through the woods, they find the kids around a campfire, terrorising a captive badger. Steve confronts the ringleader, Brett, but has a knife pulled on him and attacked by the group and their dog. In the scuffle, Steve manages to get hold of the knife, resulting in him accidentally killing their dog. This group of teenagers have finally faced some consequences for their reckless and harmful actions, but they don't view it that way. They take this as a slight against them. So even though they were the ones who had caused all of this by stealing the car and refusing to give Steve back his rightful property, they want revenge and begin in a pursuit against Jenny and Steve as they retrieve their keys and attempt to flee. They smash out the car's headlights with rocks, causing an almost blind Steve to crash down directly into a fallen down tree, pinning his chest to his seat where he is unable to move. After insisting for Jenny to leave to go get some help and save herself, she instead hides in a nearby bush until it is light again. She returns to the car in search of Steve, but finds out he's been moved. A short walk away from the crash site, she discovers the kids have a bloody and beaten Steve restrained with barbed wire against a stump and unable to move. She listens to them as Brett decides that because of what they've done and what they're about to do, they all need to be in this together. His solution to this is to make everyone involved culpable in order to deter anyone from talking to the police. He has the girl from the group film them all as they all take it in turns deeply slashing and stabbing at Steve. After they've all assaulted him, they discover Jenny right after she's just watched in horror as one of the young boys plunges the knife into Steve's mouth. They begin to chase her, making it pretty clear that they plan on doing the same, if not worse, to her. This gives Steve the opportunity to force his way out of the restraints and free himself. He returns to the car in order to retrieve a weapon and almost takes Jenny's head clean off with it as she almost runs into him. These unfortunate events may have only started out as a couple of unruly teenagers causing trouble and going for a joyride, but now it's much more than that. They've proven that they're willing to kidnap and torture. The only next logical step for them is murder. They can't leave any loose ends, especially after what they've done so far. They need to clean up their mess. There's no going back anymore. Steve and Jenny take refuge in an old bird watching hut, where Jenny then realises the severity of Steve's wounds. He doesn't just have superficial cut wounds to his flesh, one of the kids cut deep with an obvious intention to kill, and it seems like it's going to work. Jenny realises if Steve doesn't get help soon, he'll surely bleed to death. Steve, now barely able to walk, is forced to wait back and hide in a bush as Jenny makes an attempt to get back to the village to call for some help. While sprinting through the wilderness, Jenny steps on a metal spike, piercing its way right through her foot, causing her to scream out in agony. The spike is all of the way through her foot. There's no way she's going anywhere with that thing still in it. And after attempting to tug on it to get it free, she realises the only way this is coming out is if she forces it out by pushing her foot against a rock while pulling at it. After succeeding in going through with that terribly painful ordeal, she encounters the lone child that her and Steve encountered earlier. Jenny, covered in mud and her and Steve's blood, convinces the boy to show her how to get out of the woods. After some hesitation, he agrees and begins taking her, but Jenny starts to get the impression that something isn't quite right, as the boy is constantly contradicting himself with the things that he's saying almost as if he's a child caught in the middle of a lie. But before she can do anything about it, she realises that she's right in the middle of a trap. He's taken her directly to the group of kids. In an attempt to get in with the gang, this young boy has deceived Jenny in order to gain favour with the group but he's about to realise that he probably shouldn't have done that. After being punched, Jenny wakes up, tied up next to a now dead Steve. They found him and either finished him off or just let him bleed to death. They're tied up in one big bonfire of sticks, while the group then begins to pour gasoline all over her and Steve's corpse. Just like Brett did with the other kids, now this child is involved, he needs to make sure that he won't snitch. 
He hands him the box of matches and forces him to be the one to light an alive Jenny on fire while being recorded. While Brett is getting visibly excited and taking extreme pleasure at the sight of a burning corpse and the prospect of a woman being burnt alive right in front of him, the fire burns through the restraints, giving Jenny an opportunity to make a run for it. In retaliation, Brett grabs the small child, shouts out that if she doesn't come back, he'll burn too. And in the span of about three seconds, before Jenny could respond, even if she wanted to, he pours gasoline all over his head and lights him up. You can hear the agonising screams of this young boy, with Jenny then briefly turning around to see his upper half completely engulfed in flames. After witnessing what she has just seen, and her boyfriend being murdered by the group, she realises that she needs to be ready to defend herself and kill if need be. And that's exactly what Jenny does. After picking up a broken piece of glass and being approached by one of the young boys, with zero hesitation, she turns around and stabs him right through the neck, killing him. After running some more, Jenny finally comes across someone who isn't attempting to murder her. It's a man driving a car through the woods who happens to be the older brother of one of the kids as he's out looking for him. After driving with Jenny, the man gets out of the car to talk to one of the kids, and Jenny realising that this situation will probably not end well for her, steals the car and drives off, running down the female of the group as she walks out into the road. Erratically driving, due to the fear and the adrenaline, upon reaching the village, she narrowly avoids a collision with another car and crashes into someone's garden, stumbles around the back to see an ongoing party and then collapsing to the floor. In any other movie, this would be the part where she finds refuge. People who are willing to help her and take her to safety to make sure she gets out of this situation. But after being taken into the house by the residents, she comes to the disturbing realisation that she's in the house of one of the teenagers. It's Brett's house. She hides in the bathroom, looking for a way to arm herself, and then listens as the parents realise that some of their kids have been killed. They kick the door in, and in an emotional state of rage and anger, they don't listen to Jenny as she explains that she's the victim. Brett has told them some kind of story, painting Jenny and Steve as the villains of this situation. Brett's father, much like his son, tells the group that they need to look out for their own, and that they're in this together, before then taking Jenny back into the bathroom and shutting the door to the sound of her screams. This sad, depressing tale of murder ends with Brett, the main culprit behind all of this suffering, staring in the mirror as he deletes any evidence from his phone before trying on Steve's sunglasses for a final time. The movie ends in the exact same tone which has resided for its whole duration, despair. The entire duration of this movie felt like multiple gut punches one after another, a never-ending barrage of sad and upsetting events which is all topped off by the fact that the woman who had to endure all of this hardship finally makes it to a group of adults, people who should be able to help her and do the right thing and get some help. But no. These are the people who raised those kids. The kids who had just murdered a man for killing a dog in self-defence, and the kids who had just lit a child on fire for basically no reason. In the end, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. These adults are no better than their kids. Even the ones who don't think this is a great idea are still met by the same hostility and mind games from Brett's dad, just in the same manner that Brett used earlier on his friends signifying the constant loop of suffering. It was that sort of behaviour from Brett which caused this whole situation, and now his dad is going to do the exact same thing. James Watkins, the director behind Eden Lake, claims to have grown up with classic horror movies like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Wicker Man and The Last House on the Left. According to him, movies like that are simply just a part of his filmmaking DNA at this point. While not directly in your face obvious, if you know where to look, those inspirations start to make themselves known. From the isolated, unknown area the protagonists are lost in, the disturbed and deranged group of killers hunting them, all the way down to the tight-knit community and families which think that they're doing the right thing by protecting their own. These are all classic and well-explored tropes, 
and ideas which were delved into throughout the 70s, 80s and beyond. It's just, in Eden Lake, they've been modernised. The antagonists switch to a bunch of ruthless kids and placed within a setting which is hardly used compared to its American counterparts. And speaking of the kids, bad child actors would have absolutely destroyed any tension or belief surrounding the events within this film. Child actors have gained quite the reputation of being, well, bad. But Eden Lake is expertly casted, with each of the roles feeling like they've been filled and played by real people, and not just some kid pretending to be someone else. Several of the children in this movie would go on to become well-regarded actors in their own right. From Thomas Turgoose, who would be most well known for his role in the This Is England movie and the TV series, as well as Jack O'Connell, well regarded for his role in Skins, who would then later go on to land some pretty serious roles in big time productions. Not to forget the main protagonists being well renowned actors Kelly Riley and the ultra famous Michael Fassbender. For directorial debut, that's certainly not a bad cast of characters for James Watkins to get. Eden Lake is one of those movies which doesn't have a happy ending. In fact, there's nothing particularly happy about any of the events in this movie. To loop back to the beginning, it's a movie which tries with every fibre of its being to make you feel as absolutely terrible as possible. Before we wrap things up, I just wanted to say a big thank you to my patrons. Thank you to Dom, Bort, Hunters263, Caleb Barnaby, Victor N, Rebecca Pitts, Nicholas, Benz, Jungle Dude, Jacob, Natobi, and Simon Windsor. YouTube isn't particularly a fan of this type of content. Chances are it gets demonetized or limited ads, which means basically no monetization anyway, or in the other case, an unfair copyright claim, meaning I see no income at all. So it's super inspiring to me that there are people out there who are actually willing to financially support the channel. So thank you guys. The channel also has a Discord server, so if you want to discuss this movie or other movies in general with like-minded people, there's now a place where you can do that. And if you wanted to leave me a movie recommendation, that would be the best place to do so. Once again, thank you so much to my patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.